Hello there, my name is James Duffy and I will be your Sherpa as we start a build of the new 1/100th scale Saturn 1B kit from Estes. This is a really exciting new kit and I'm looking forward to sharing my progress with everyone. Some months ago I posted an unboxing of this particular kit and that little inspection revealed that this is so much more than a simple re-release of a vintage kit. Rather, it's a, a pretty thorough reimagining of the earlier versions of the kit with so many new parts that it should probably be considered a new kit, not a re-release. Now, my personal take on big projects is that they are nothing more than a whole bunch of simple, small projects that we tackle in a logical sequence. We'll be doing exactly that here and we'll be departing from the kit instructions in a pretty significant manner. Whenever possible, individual components and sub-assemblies will be completely painted and decaled before we bring everything together. I should mention that this will be covering some pretty basic techniques and is aimed at those who have not yet completed a serious scale rocket project. Still, if you're a more advanced craftsperson, I hope you might find a useful trick or two. Let's get started by prepping the paper tubes. The tubes used by Estes and other model rocket manufacturers are great stuff. They're light, they're strong, they're durable, they're easy to paint, but they do have this nasty spiral line that's an artifact of the manufacturing process. Fortunately, there's an easy way to get rid of that spiral. This is Rust-Oleum Gray Automotive Primer, and it's available at any Home Depot store. It's a high solids primer, which simply means that it goes on pretty thick, making it great for filling our nasty tube spirals. Our first task is to find the tubes in the kit that will end up with a paint finish on them. We don't need to prime the motor mount tube, for instance. Here are the tubes that we need to locate for priming. First, there are the eight fuel tank tubes. This large tube will become the S4B second stage of our rocket. This short tube will become the service module. And this little tiny tube that looks a whole lot like a launch lug will represent the launch escape motor. The process is simple. Each tube will get a couple of coats of primer applied with no more than five to seven minutes between coats. We'll let the tubes dry for a few hours, then we'll sand off most of the primer and repeat the process. Your dry time may be shorter or longer depending on the humidity in your area. Before we apply the primer, let's take each of the eight fuel tanks and place a strip of quarter inch wide masking tape along one side of each. This is going to give us an unpainted area on each tube that we'll use to glue each tank to the inner core tube in a later step. Okay, we're now out in my outdoor paint booth, which is actually my wife's horse trailer. If you don't have a horse trailer handy, a cattle trailer or a goat trailer should work just as well. Seriously, you want to get out of the wind and you want to get in a relatively clean area. Admittedly, this is not the perfect environment here. So I've attached the S4B part to a tube for handling purposes, and we're going to start spraying some primer. What we're going to do is start off of the part, move down the part, and end off of the part. Let's spray some primer. I'm not trying to inundate the part at this point. All I want to do is put that first layer on very lightly. I'll come back in about four to five minutes and put another layer on. Remember that we need to repeat this process with all of the tubes we looked at a moment ago. Okay, our primer has dried and now we can start sanding. I like to start with 240 grit paper and then move to 400 grit paper. If we do this properly, we'll remove most of the primer in the process.
At this point, we can go ahead and build the motor mount assembly just like it's shown in the instructions. We're going to use a waterproof aliphatic resin glue. This is Tight Bond 2. Once it dries, we can set it to the side for later integration into the completed model. Next, we'll install the Vacuform body wraps. The idea of working with Vacuform has freaked out model builders for over 50 years. There's really no reason to be terrified of this process. If you take away anything from this little build video, I hope it's the understanding that Vacuform parts can be used successfully and without any unnecessary drama. So what is Vacuform plastic? Vacuforming is the same process that's used to make many consumer packages, like this ukulele hanger package or this battery box. Plastic is heated, then drawn down over a mold using vacuum pressure. The finished product looks great, and critically for model rocket applications, the finished part is light. Here's the fin can of a V2 model I made several years ago from the Estes Maxi Brute kit, and it has some great looking fins that were made from vacuform plastic. We're going to follow the kit instructions to trim and fit the parts and mark the locations on the tubes. We'll start with the aft thrust structure. The wrap is just a bit too long, so we can use a fresh blade to slice off a bit of the end. You can estimate the amount to remove by overlapping the ends and then marking with a pencil. Note that it's preferable to trim too little off and find out that you need to cut more than it is to cut too much. The critical thing is to go slow, take your time, use sharp, fresh blades, and continually test and retest the fit of the wrap. That's a really good circumferential fit there. We're going to use 3M High Strength 90 spray adhesive to apply the wraps. There are some who prefer the 3M Type 77 adhesive and that's fine. In my experience though, the Type 90 is just a little bit more tenacious and resists the urge to pull up at the edges. Type 90 is a spray contact adhesive. You have to apply it to both surfaces to be joined. Let's do a little demo here. This is just some paper I've got on the workbench here. It goes on in a pattern that looks like lace or perhaps a web. This isn't paint. You've got to resist the urge to put multiple heavy coats on the surfaces to be joined. Once the adhesive has been applied to both surfaces to be joined, we'll let the solvents flash off for about seven to 10 minutes. Let's put some adhesive on these parts. I've attached the wrap with a little tiny flag of tape on the back side so it won't blow away. A sheet of copy paper has been coiled up and taped to the inside of this thrust mount tube so that we can avoid getting any overspray on the inside of the tube. We're about ready to spray. Note the web pattern or the lace-like pattern of the material as it goes onto the tube. We're not looking to put multiple coats here. Let's bring the wrap and the tube together. It's a good idea to set the tube flat on the work surface 
and then curl the wrap around the tube, at least for the thrust structure component. One of the cool things about this adhesive is the fact that you'll have a few seconds to pull the parts apart and reposition things if you get a slight misalignment in play. Once everything is in place, we'll put a piece of masking tape along the seam to let the glue cure for a couple of hours. Let's get started. And there we have it. After the adhesive cures for a couple of hours, we can move on to the next step. Okay, we need to refine the ends of our lower thrust structure. We've removed the piece of tape, and this is a piece of sandpaper that's taped to the back of a board. We're going to slowly move both sides of the thrust structure against the paper to remove any overlap of the plastic beyond the end of the tube. You want to work slowly and continually rotate the part. We don't want any high or low spots. When the plastic is level with the underlying paper tube, you're done. Let's do a little unplanned bonus bit here. The seam on this wrap is just a bit wide for my taste, but fortunately there's an easy way to fix that. We're going to put drops of medium CA glue into this gap. We'll add a bit of accelerator, and then we'll sand the excess away with a sanding stick. Medium CA has great gap filling properties that make it ideal for this application. Now you can use the tip of a number 11 blade to place the drops of glue in place, or you can make your very own tool for this purpose. This is a common sewing needle that has had the end of the eye ground away, creating a Y-shaped tool that's great for picking up a single drop of CA adhesive. I've got it chucked up in a pen vise. We'll just dip this into a puddle of CA and place it into place. Here's how this process works. You just dip the tool into the puddle of CA, place it on the model, And then hit that with a little bit of accelerator. It will flash off almost immediately. I like to wipe it away real quick. And then we use a sanding stick to smooth out the gap. Okay, now we can move up the seam just a little bit. and repeat the process. And there, that's all there is to that. That whole process has taken about four minutes. Let's move on to the S4B upper stage. There are two wraps to be applied here, and we're going to put them on separately trying to spray both wraps with adhesives simultaneously would be a recipe for sadness, and this is a happy workshop. We'll start on the top wrap. Now our first step is to draw a reference line along the tube. Next, we'll trim the fore and aft edges of the two wraps as noted in the directions. We're going to use a fresh blade for this and try not to go all of the way through the plastic. It's better to simply score the plastic, then bend it along the score line.
Next, we're going to draw four lines around the tube to define the top and bottom of each wrap. The top wrap starts 10 millimeters below the forward edge of the tube, and the aft wrap, that's the, the bigger one, starts six millimeters up from the aft end of the tube. These dimensions are straight out of the kit directions and I've already marked them on the tube. With those positions marked, we can then use the trimmed wraps to help define the other two lines around the tube. Now we'll trim the ends of each wrap just like we did for the thrust structure wrap. Okay, we've trimmed the upper and lower wraps to size, so let's spray the adhesive for the upper wrap. Our S4B tube has been masked to restrict the adhesive to just the upper wrap area. I used Tamiya masking tape for the areas where the tape touches the tube, and then I used inexpensive masking tape to attach the overspray masks to that. The overspray masks are just simple printer paper. There's also a rolled up sheet of paper inside the tube to keep overspray off of the inside surfaces. We're ready to apply the upper wrap. Note that I've highlighted our reference line just a little bit. It's critical that we use this as the starting point for both of the upper stage wraps so that the cable raceway locations line up. While we're on that subject, let's point out that this is a really great opportunity to make a really dumb mistake. We need to make sure that those cable raceway locations line up and it's critical that the upper wrap location be pointing down. I've added a bit of tape to make that detail just a little bit more obvious. We've got a little bit of a gap here at our seam. That's easy to fix. We'll just use our CA seam filling technique that we learned a little bit earlier. Here's our upper stage with the masking removed. If there should be any adhesive residue sticking out of any of the edges, it should be a fairly simple matter to just use your fingers to rub them off, or if there's something more stubborn, you might be able to use some tweezers to pull the threads out. There are two cable raceway parts included on one of the injection molded sprues included with the kit. We'll remove these with sprue nippers then clean up the ends with a sanding stick.
Let's take a closer look at the back of these parts. Note that they have steps on them. I'll darken them with a pencil right here. These steps will fit over the wraps that we've just installed. On the longer part, note that one stepped area is longer than the other. The longer end will install in place over the upper wrap. We'll use five minute epoxy to attach these parts to the airframe tube. It's also a good idea to check alignment with a ruler. I'm cleaning up some squeeze out with a clean Q-tip that I've moistened in rubbing alcohol. After the epoxy sets up, we can brush a bit of thin plastic cement to the locations where the raceway contacts the wrap parts. This is Tamiya extra thin cement that I'll be using. Let's move back to the thrust structure. We can now glue the shroud part into place on the forward end of the thrust structure. Now the forward end of the thrust structure is the side away from the raised areas. So you'll want these raised areas aft. We're going to use five minute epoxy for this step, which will give us plenty of time to rotate the parts to align one of the fin slots with our seam line. Again, we're aligning one of the fin slots with the seam. Check inside if there's any glue squeeze out. Be sure to clean that up. We'll want to do that to make sure that everything fits together when we install the central core of the rocket. Now the kit directions would have you install the fins at this point, but we're not going to do that. This model will be much easier to mask and paint if we do all of that before final assembly. More on that later. The Estes Saturn 1B kit has a wealth of new injection molded plastic parts and we've already installed a couple of them on the second stage. Now we're going to prep and prime the rest of them. We'll start with the fins. These are beautifully molded but they have a nasty seam line on the trailing edge. That's the aft edge of the fin. You could build the kit and no one would ever see that flaw, but you'll know it's there. Take a few minutes to eliminate that seam with a sanding stick. Next, we'll attach these alligator clip clamps to the fins for ease of handling while we prime and paint them. These are long-tailed alligator clips sold for photo displays. I was able to pick up a pack of 50 for about $8 off of Amazon. They're great to have around. Just clip the holder onto the little barb that will eventually engage with the shroud assembly. Let's take a look at the capsule and launch escape system parts. These are from a new injection molding tool that Estes created for the revised Saturn V kit a couple of years ago, and they are a major upgrade from the legacy version that's been around for over half a century. We're going to go ahead and assemble the launch escape system lattice. Find the two lattice halves as well as the little circular brace that fits within the lattice structure. We're going to drop the circle into place in the lattice and then hit that joint with a couple of drops of thin cement. This is standard plastic model assembly cement. We'll let that set up for a few seconds. and then we'll put the other side of the lattice in place. There are locator pins that will help guide this assembly. Just hit the seam with a little bit of cement. 
It's not necessary to do the whole thing. I like to use the tweezers to clamp that shut for a few seconds. And we can do the other end of the lattice and repeat the process. Let's flip the lattice over and do the other side. I'm going to add a drop or two to that internal circular structure. And there, the tower lattice is complete. The lattice assembly looks great, although the structure is just a bit on the chunky side. To fix that, let me show you this gem that Mike Nowak at Galactic Manufacturing shared with me. This is a 3D printed tower lattice that Mike designed for the Saturn V model that he flies in FAI competition and it looks fantastic. In particular, the structure is much thinner than the injection molded parts included with the kit. We'll be using this for our model, although I'll paint and prep the kit component just in case the upgrade part gets damaged. The Saturn 1B mounted many of the telemetry and range safety antennas on four panels that were attached to the forward end of the first stage. We're going to use double-sided tape to attach these to this old yardstick for painting. We'll also attach the rocket nozzles for the display set and all the other parts that we've prepped to get them ready for priming. Let's talk about paint. Now you could spray your model with standard Krylon or Rust-Oleum utility paint from the hardware store, but this is a quality kit and we're making every effort to honor the kit with a quality build. So shouldn't we use quality paints? Well, absolutely we should. I like to use Tamiya paint products whenever possible as they have never ever let me down. All of the white surfaces on our Saturn 1B are going to be painted with Tamiya TS26 Pure White Spray Lacquer. This is a high quality, fast drying paint that has the added advantage of being almost idiot proof. It's expensive, but you and your model are worth it. Before we spray the white base coat, we need to prime all of the parts. We'll be using Tamiya White Primer. A couple of light coats on everything will do the trick, and we'll wait just about seven to 10 minutes between coats. After the primer cures for a couple of hours, we can sand everything with thousand grit sanding film. All we need to do is give a quick sanding pass to knock the fuzz off of the primer coat. After sanding the primer, hit everything with a tack cloth and we're ready to paint. This step will grab any stray sanding dust that's still on the parts. These are cheap cheesecloth tack cloths that I buy at Home Depot and I keep them in a Ziploc bag between uses. A pack of these will last me for several years. We're back in our horse trailer slash paint booth to paint the color coat. The paint will be applied in multiple light coats with an emphasis on light and will allow each layer to dry about seven to 10 minutes. Stick to that application schedule and you'll end up with great looking parts. That allows the paint to cure enough to avoid the possibility of a run, but still be tacky enough so that each additional coat can still chemically latch onto the previous layer. Just like the primer, we're going to start and stop each pass off of the part. We'll let all of our parts dry overnight. Among the most striking features of the Saturn 1B are the clustered fuel tanks. Four of these tanks contained a kerosene fuel called RP1, and four contained liquid oxygen. 
These tanks borrowed much of their design from the earlier Redstone booster, and the same tooling used to make those Redstone airframes was repurposed for use on the Saturn 1B. There's even more reuse buried under the skin, as the Saturn 1B also had an additional oxidizer tank buried deep within that ring of eight Redstone tanks, and that larger central tank was based on the Jupiter missile. On the earlier Saturn ones that flew, these tanks alternated between black and white for temperature management purposes, and the alternating pattern also helped with tracking. The black tanks absorbed more sunlight than the white tanks, which led to some unexpected deformations in the surface of those parts. Because of that, all of the Saturn 1Bs used for Skylab and the Apollo Soyuz test program went to an all-white paint scheme on the fuel tanks. They still retained the distinctive black and white roll patterns on the rest of the vehicle, though. Now that the paint on our fuel tanks is dried, we can begin assembling our tank structure. We'll start by pulling the masking tape we placed on these glue lines off of each tank. Next, we'll follow the procedure and the instructions for assembling the central core. I'll be using Type Bond 2 for assembly. Let's get started on installing the individual tanks. Just as an FYI, there's a slot in my workbench right here through which the centering ring at the base of the core can be installed. We'll apply some glue to the glue line on each of the tanks. Gently press it up against the central core tank and hold it there until the glue sets up. The first five tanks were installed with the structure flat on the workbench, and then the final three tanks are installed with everything vertical. With all eight tanks in place, we can go ahead and install the engine mount exactly as described in the kit instructions. We've gone ahead and painted the service module tube silver off camera, which would seem pretty straightforward. You could just go ahead and hit the part with a few coats of silver paint and be done with it. Instead, we did something a little counterintuitive and painted the part black before applying the silver lacquer. The theory is that this makes the silver seem a bit richer, deeper, and more realistic. And based on my experience over the years, I agree. If you ever build a Little Joe 2 model in the future, this is a great trick for the lower airframe and fins. Black first, then silver. With our painted service module in hand, we can go ahead and mark the RCS thruster locations. Just wrap the template around the part, and then we can mark each location with an awl, then drill out the locations with a tiny drill bit. The cone and skirt are added to the launch escape system motor tube with a little bit of epoxy. Next, we add the LES nozzles to the underside of the skirt with some liquid cement. The 3D printed tower lattice from Galactic Manufacturing is then mounted to the command module with a little bit of epoxy and the LES motor subassembly is added on top of that. After reviewing some photos of the Apollo service module, I decided to paint the RCS thruster modules gray and then use a tiny paintbrush to paint the nozzles gold. We're going to paint the black areas on our Saturn 1B with Tamiya NATO black acrylic paint applied with a Pache SI single action airbrush. Our compressor will be set to provide about 12 pounds per square inch of pressure. That low pressure is important as it'll help prevent any spray from creeping under the masking tape. I suggest that you paint just one quadrant at a time. 
We'll start with the easy one, which is entirely black. Just mask along this line from the top tip of the shroud all the way to the base of the thrust structure. We're using Tamiya masking tape for the paint lines. Move one quarter of the way around the thrust structure and mask the other side of the quadrant. Just put some overspray masking in place and we're ready to paint. Cheap tape is fine for attaching the overspray masks. Let's do the section to the right of the all black section next. On this quad, the upper section is black and the mask line is 13 millimeters below this joint line. Note that I'm using a 13 millimeter wide strip of paper as a template for applying the tape. The next quad is white on top and black on bottom. The mask line continues over from the previous section. Each of the eight fins has a different paint pattern. The best way to tackle these is to temporarily fit each one in place, then transfer the mask line from the thrust structure to the fin. I've already completed seven of them, and we have the last one to go. Now that the fins are all masked, we can use our handling clamps to hold them for painting. With our thrust structure painted, we can now move on to the S4B second stage and paint the roll pattern there. Our approach will be just the same. We're going to paint the black sections one at a time. Now there are a couple of black stripes on this part that go all the way around the stage, one here and one about here. And masking over these corrugations can be tricky. We're going to start with the top band, which extends from the forward edge of the stage down 24 millimeters. That puts the aft edge of the stripe over the middle of the corrugations. I've put a piece of tape in place as a guide. The best way I've found to approach this is to use a small dowel to burnish the tape down into the valley of each corrugation. We're using six millimeter masking tape here. The second stripe is a little trickier as we have a few sand traps in the way. The top edge is at the leading edge of the lower wrap and that's easy to mask. The aft edge is 13 millimeters below that and there are a few surface details in the way. That's no problem. We'll just use short pieces of tape between each of the obstacles and then go back and mask over the details. I've already installed some guide strips in place. Like before, we're using the pointed end of a dowel to work the tape down into the corrugation valleys. These little details are kind of cool. The two big ones are called the auxiliary propulsion system, and there are two of them on opposite sides of the stage. They each contained multiple thrusters and provided attitude control for the stage. The three smaller triangular ones are called ullage motors, and they contained small solid propellant motors that were fired to settle the liquid propellants in the tanks before ignition. They're black now, but we can mask them all off and paint them silver.
There, we've got all of the masking off of the silver bits. It came out pretty cleanly. There are a couple of spots where I'll refine the line with some black paint and a brush, though. We can now move down the stage and paint the four vertical stripes. Each stripe extends from the center line of this ullage motor detail and moves to the left to the center line of this detail. One tricky challenge is that the ullage motor should be white, so we'll need to mask around that bit. The top edge is along this indented feature right here, and the bottom edge is the bottom of the wrap. You can see I've already masked that off. And our first quadrant is completed. We still have three more to do, but that'll just take a few minutes. It's finally time to start bringing everything together. We'll start with the thrust structure and the tube section. Just slide it down the tube section with the understanding that this is likely a one-way trip. Let me take a moment to get everything aligned. And we're in place. We'll apply some epoxy here to the joint on the inside using a Q-tip. At this point, we can also add the centering rings to the upper core tube. We'll be using epoxy again. The simulated first stage nozzles have been painted using the black undercoat silver overcoat layer trick that we used on the service module tube. Also the mounting plate has been painted with a light gray lacquer. We can now pop each of the nozzles in place, making sure to place the ones with the collar feature on the outside edge. These represent the H1 motors that would gimbal for guidance during boost while the inner motors that don't have that collar were fixed in place. Once they're all in place, we can flip them over and fix them in place with some medium CA glue. Next, we can glue the spacer tube in place. And with that, our simulated nozzles are complete. The RCS nozzles are put in place with a tiny bit of epoxy. This detail simulates the cover over all of the connectors between the command and service modules and it needs to be silver. We'll finish masking it off and spray it with flat aluminum acrylic. The antenna boards have already been painted and the directions call for the antenna blades to be painted yellow. Frankly, I think that the protective covers placed over the antennas were yellow, but that the blades underneath were a dark metallic color. Still, I like the flash of color that the yellow provides. If this were a more in-depth scale project, I'd do some more research on the subject. We've reached a bit of a milestone in our Saturn 1B project, and all of our major project elements have been completely assembled and painted. All that remains is for us to apply the decals and bring everything together. 
The decals included with the Estes kit are for a specific launch of a Saturn 1B. That was the first launch of a crew to the Skylab space station on May 25, 1973. Decals adhere best to a glossy surface, so we've applied a clear gloss coat off camera to everything that received a dose of the matte NATO black color. The spacecraft elements at the pointy end are already glossy, so they don't need a gloss coat. We can start installing our decals here. First up are the curved United States and flag markings, which we'll put on the command module. The first one will go on the capsule shroud, just to the right of the silver cable cover, in line with the leg of the escape tower. That means that this decal will go over a raised detail. I'll show you how to deal with that. We'll start by dipping the decal in room temperature water for about 20 seconds. Next, we'll just set it to the side and allow the adhesive to activate. Before we slide it into position, we'll wet the location that it's going to be applied to with some micro set. This is a decal setting solution and its job is to lower the surface tension of the water. In short, it makes the water wetter, if that makes any sense. It's a mild acetic acid solution. If you've ever done darkroom work, you may recognize the smell of stop bath, which is essentially the same stuff. Okay, we can now slide the decal into position, pull the backing paper away, Use our tweezers to refine the location a little bit. I can use the edge of a tissue to wick some of the excess moisture away. Whoops, got away from me there. Use a brush to ease that back into position. Now, what do we do about this raised detail? How can we get the decal to flow elegantly over that obstacle so that it looks like paint? We're going to use a decal solvent. This stuff is called Microsol, and it will gently soften the decal, allowing it to conform over the underlying surface. Just gently dab a bit over the decal. It may move around a little bit. Get it good and wet. If you get too much on there, you can wick some away. Continually refine the position. Once you have it in place, just walk away. Don't disturb it at all. The process may take an hour or two, depending on the humidity where you are and the decal may even wrinkle up a bit. Don't be alarmed if it does that. Just trust the process. We'll move down to the service module and place the straight United States slash flag markings on opposite sides. We'll center those up between the RCS squads. There's no underlying surface detail here and the paint is already glossy, so we won't need the Microsol solvent, just the Microset setting agent. By the way, you can grab both of these products on Amazon. Let's move down to the S4B second stage. The four USA markings are installed over the white sections of the roll pattern with the end centered between the two wraps. Again, we're using the micro set here, but the underlying surface is smooth, so we don't need to use the solvent. Next, we'll move down to the first stage. Start with the SA-206 markings, which are unique to the Saturn 1B used to launch the first Skylab crew to the space station. These are applied to the tanks above the left side of each roll pattern quad, with the upper edge about three millimeters below the upper barbs of the shroud part. Before we apply the long United States markings to the lower tank, we'll need to trim a bit of the white backing from both the top and the bottom of each of those. 
After we do that, we can line up the lower edge of the bottom letter with the forward end of the barbs of the shroud. Next, we'll add the camera targets, first motion markings, and sway motion targets. The kit directions can guide you on the location of the camera targets and the first motion marking. The sway markings are a bit tougher. I actually had to research these. There are three of these on the forward wrap in the black area, so you'll end up with an unused marking. If we project an imaginary line from the APS thrusters forward, the sway markings will be just to the right of that line. Let's go ahead and install one. Remember that there is an APS module on each side of the second stage, so you'll need to duplicate this on the other side of the model. The third sway marking is on the side of the S4B stage opposite the cable raceway, just to the right of an imaginary line defined by the border of the white and black roll pattern roughly between these two raised details. Finally, let's install the fin markings. Use the directions in the kit box art to guide you here and take care to make sure that you're placing the right decal on the correct fin. This is an easy step to get wrong. Just as a sanity check, let's take a quick view of each side of each of the completed fins to use as a simple reference. Here's quad one, quad two, quad three, and quad four. Let's go back and take a close look at the United States marking on the command module. Note how the decal conforms with this panel line detail and that the finished marking looks like paint. That's what the decal solvent does on an irregular surface. It really is magical stuff. Once the decals have dried overnight, I like to clean up any stray adhesive that may have squeezed out by cleaning around each marking with a damp Q-tip. And just like that, we're done with the cowl application. So finally, it's time to bring everything together. We'll start by gluing the S4B second stage in place atop the first stage. We'll be using five minute epoxy for this step for a couple of important reasons. First, epoxy is a dimensionally stable adhesive. In other words, the stuff stays the same size and shape as it cures. If we were to use an aliphatic resin glue like tight bond, we might end up with a nasty mark on the outside of the airframe as this stuff shrinks slightly as it dries. Next, the epoxy will give us a few moments to refine our fit and position before it grabs. So, how do we line everything up? Look for the long cable raceway on the second stage. It's going to be roughly over the left side of this quad on the first stage. The eight segments of the black and white roll pattern will be centered over each of the tanks. And the four ullage motors will be centered over the little valleys between the tanks. I placed a couple of tape flags right here to help guide me. This particular piece of tape has been placed six millimeters down from the top of the fuel tank. That will give us the correct positioning when everything's in place. We've mixed up some five minute epoxy and I'm going to use a Q-tip to place a bead of it inside the second stage. We'll slide the second stage into position and begin lining everything up. Wiggle everything around a bit to ensure distribution of the glue inside. 
And when you're satisfied with the positioning, just set everything down. Next, we'll install the service module onto the LM adapter shroud. Look for the hatch details on either side of the shroud. There's a panel line that runs beneath each hatch. That panel line will align with the RCS quad to the left of the United States marking. We can use a little bit of epoxy to install the service module. Let's fit the command module into the forward end of the service module and align the cable cover just to the right of one of the RCS quads with the United States markings out of phase with each other. I'm going to recommend that you not glue this in place. It's a pretty fragile bit and it might require repair or replacement at some point in the future. Also, don't forget to put the nose weight into the command module. In order to make the antenna boards easier to mount between the first stage tanks, we're going to add small slivers of thin balsa to the back edges of each, then sand a bevel into the wood. This will give us a little more meat for a good joint. The decal application diagram in the kit instructions does a pretty good job of showing where each of the antenna boards should go. Tiny drops of medium CA are great for attaching these parts. Finally, let's put our fins in place. Just use the tip of an X-Acto blade to scrape a bit of paint off of the attachment barb and from the inside of the attachment slot. It's also a good idea to scrape the paint with a fin root will meet the surface of the thrust structure. We'll then use liquid model cement to attach each fin, and the bare plastic will make the joint stronger. Here's our completed Saturn 1B model. Keep in mind that the skills used for this project can be used for a whole bunch of different models. If you have an ESDES Saturn 5 or Skylab kit, the techniques we've used here are identical for those kits, as well as the Apogee Saturn V and 1B twins. Thanks for watching and good luck on your Saturn project.